So good morning, Synergy. How are you guys doing? Great. So how was the super session this morning? We could not attend. I see some thumbs up, so that's good. So I hope we will inspire you as well with our uh, content around uh, yeah, performance uh, measurements and best practices around uh, hybrid clouds, public clouds, and uh, private clouds as well. So if you want to share something during this presentation, please uh, use one of those two hashtags, uh, Syn201 or Citrix Synergy. I encourage you to tweet, make pictures, do anything what you like, and we will retweet it as well after this session. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce myself. So I'm uh, Christian Brinkhoff. I uh, live in the Netherlands, as you probably already saw on my shirt here. Um, I'm working as a cloud architect and technology evangelist for, uh, for Microsoft right now. Um, I worked for Avis Logix, which is acquired by Microsoft, so it's great to be part of a you know, very big company. Um, I'm also uh, active in several communities, uh, such as the Citrix CTP community, and uh, I'm an Azure MVP as well. Uh, I'm a part of the VDI Like a Pro uh, program, and uh, you can also uh, follow me on Twitter to keep updated on like cloud-related stuff uh, on my Twitter handle, brink of underscore C. And I'm also uh, give away some Stroop waffles from the Netherlands. So who loves Stroop waffles over here? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. So, so I have 50 Stroop waffles with me over here. So if you have questions, uh, please grab one. But even for people that don't have questions, can get a Stroop waffle. So no worries. Um, and next to that, I'm also currently working on a new community project, which is a book project, which is called Bite Size. I do that together with another uh, previous CTP, Bess from Cam. You probably know him. Um, and with that project, we create a book where we gather all cloud knowledge of people from the community, MVPs, CTPs, um, and we release that on the 7th of June next month. So if you are interested, these are the names. I don't know if you can read them, but all the big names are in the book. Uh, so if you scan that QR code, you can see uh, yeah, how many days it still lasts, and when you can order it, you can find it on the website as well. Uh, with me, I have. And I, I highly recommend, actually, I've been contributing with free yeah, uh, quotes he has, he has the a book. privilege to have three quotes. So yeah. my, my name is uh, Thomas uh, Pobble Gard, Go in Danish. Anyways, uh, I'm an uh, independent consultant. Uh, the blog I have, pobblegaard.com, is actually something I've been doing for, well, it's nine years, and that's my company name. I'm also a Danish Citrix user group leader, and I'm part of many different communities, both with Citrix, Microsoft, NVIDIA, VMware, and, and et cetera. And I come from Denmark, which is the land of Lego. And we have this uh, awesome new Lego house. I highly recommend you come to Denmark and experience it. It is something really one extraordinary experience. And uh, I live close to the uh, city called Aarhus, which is uh, the top 10 cool cities in the world now. We just got something out I saw here the other day in newspaper. So I highly recommend you come to Denmark. So what do, do we have any from Denmark in here? Yeah, awesome. Well, Do we have any, any <laughs> Dutch people? Okay. So what awesome. do we have in common between the Danish and the Dutch people? We actually have can milk. We pronounce the same thing, and it's the same thing. It's, it's a weird thing. Um, and you're like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> so trust me, this is really funny, because a lot of Danish and Dutch people, they don't know that we have the same words. So remember this. Because you and you and everybody, well, can win a prize. <laughs> we got a Red Bull car here, which is an uh, RC, yeah. right? It's the Max Verstappen version of the Red Bull racing car over here. Yeah. So you can win that one. Chris and bring it all the way from the Netherlands. And then we also have an in-computing Raspberry Pi to run awesome HDX. And don't forget the swoop valve was to mention for the second time, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's the most important thing with it. So, where do you think of when you hear the word clouds? Uh, when I talk with customers in the field, I get different answers to that. Uh, but probably the main thing to, uh, yeah, to, to, to do or to gain is, 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 is cost. You want to leverage clouds to yeah, be better in your procedure and have a simplified way of managing and maintain your environment. Uh, but cost is one that I uh, get uh, most often when I uh, ask questions or get questions around that. Uh, and platform leveraging platform services, that is one thing to, uh, to, to keep in mind when you go to the cloud. But what we more think is 
something around end user experience because when you leverage VDI desktop virtualization in the cloud, that's basically the thing that stays left. And I will cover that later on uh, in a more depth way. And performance, obviously, as well. And disruption, because going from on-premises to the cloud, that creates new possibilities, new technologies, improvements as well. And a similar thing is, is what SpaceX is doing right now. It's not IT technology, but it's, it's disruptive as well in space technology. And that is improving the procedure of launching a, a rocket to, to like uh, the atmosphere to Mars or eventually to Mars. And they made it possible as well to reuse, to, to reuse that, that rocket and uh, yeah, can, can, can like use it again for a next launch. So that is awesome. And we have that as well, like the same sort of like disruptive way with the transformation from VDI and SPC to desktop as a service. Um, so you probably saw the keynote yesterday where Citrix announced uh, the Citrix Managed Desktop, which is based on a desktop as a service on Windows Virtual Desktop as well. That's a desktop as a service offering which is available as part of Citrix. And the real difference between traditional VDI and SPC is basically that you are not responsible anymore of the brokering, the web service, uh, networking, maintenance, uh, the server storage, and the hypervisor layer of that. So that yeah, simplifies the way how you manage and maintain your, your desktop virtualization environment in the cloud. So, so when you look at desktop, desktop as a service, DAS, you are only responsible as customer or as a partner for image management, improving that image, making that image as, as best as possible for your end users. So that's the focus. It's, it's end user experience. And that's the reason why we think that it is now time to focus more on desktop and end user experience. Oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> Christian. Just, just checking if you guys are still sharp. <laughs> so virtualization today has like two different sort of options in terms of like operating system you have on the left side here, you have Windows Server, which is multi-user capable. So you use like Server 2012, 2016, or 2019. You have the multi-user approach. Uh, it's Win32 app capable. Uh, you can use Office Perpetual, and you get a long time service channel release management. So that basically means is when you get a an Server 2019, that's, that's where you get the new features in. On the right side, you have a Windows Enterprise, which is like Windows 10, Windows, Windows 7, or Windows 8. And that is based on single user, uh, also Win32 capable, UEP cap capable as well, and capable to use Office 365 Pro Plus. And the other difference between Windows Server is that it is semi-annual channel on a semi-annual channel update cycle. So you get updates and features uh, during the six months of, of build updates that you get with Windows 10, for example. Uh, so with that thought in mind, there's a new version of the operating system, and that is Windows 10 multi-user. And that's sort of like best of both worlds. So you get like the multi-user capabilities of Windows Server, and you get like the, the experience of, of Windows 10. So it's best of both worlds, and as well, it's Office 65 uh, supported and semi-annual channel update cycle supported. So you get along the same cycle along the same updates as, as part of Windows 10. So that's great. And that's something that Citrix announced yesterday that will be part of the Citrix managed desktop service and as well as part of the virtual apps and desktop service in the Citrix cloud. So you could leverage as customer as well Windows 10 multi-user uh, in two different options. The Citrix managed desktop is a desktop as a service option that I explained in, uh, in the previous slide. So that gives you the same benefit in like maintenance and everything that you don't need to be uh, or don't are like responsible for yourself uh, as a traditional VDI environment or SPC environment. So when you look at Citrix Managed Desktop, you have several options. Citrix can do everything for you, like maintaining and they own like the subscription of Azure. You have another option where you connect with your Azure AD to that uh, Citrix Managed Desktop. And there's another option to just uh, inject your own Azure AD and there's another option to connect to your on-premises environment. So it's a great option to use DAS and maybe to use it in a hybrid mode as well to yeah, migrate your, your, your VDI environment to, uh, uh, to the cloud eventually. And this is the 
screen that you get to, uh, bless you, uh, to configure a Citrix Managed Desktop in the Citrix Cloud. So it's very simplified. You just select your SKU, your sizing, your optimized image, your amount of users, your machines, and then you're good to go. So if you want to know more about Windows Virtual Desktop, uh, I recommend and encourage you to visit those three sessions. Uh, today there's one, and there are two tomorrow. And there are people from Microsoft in that session and people from Citrix, and they run you through all the different options around that. So let's talk about the good stuff. The road to the cloud. So it can be a long journey and can be a short journey. And it all depends. So where a lot of people are today is the private clouds. The on-prem data centers, that's what I'm most specific talking about. And making a journey to the cloud is for some customers even hybrid. They don't go to a local service provider. They push, move up some of the IT up there so they get uh, desktop as a service there. While others, what Microsoft and Citrix, et cetera, are trying to go for the public clouds where they take care of the managed services. The thing is, I believe the hybrid cloud is going to be here for a really long time because it's about data transition, where you have data on, on the private clouds, and transitioning all the data up there is something that takes time. Also because we get more and more clouds out there, which will be hybrid with different services. Edge Cloud is actually something new I want to highlight that companies are doing because we see machines are going, going to go much more out the edge to collect data. This is also where you need data centers. And this is just another one where you put that in, in the hybrid cloud uh, transformation. So what kind of value do Citrix bring as a bridge between these clouds? So in their workspace, they're actually capable of uh, delivering uh, the desktops, both from any cloud they have. And as you saw in the keynote yesterday, they now also have uh, Google Cloud with machine crazy services. So Citrix is actually the only one which is the most uh, agnostic uh, provider uh, across all clouds. They even have it for Oracle Cloud, which is really amazing. And they also support the Windows Virtual Desktop here. We can also then add the published applications and, and see that in the same control plane and the modern SaaS and the micro applications. So if you look at the hybrid cloud, typical journey to Azure is when people do, do POC, some do point to site, uh, others they do side to site. The problem is, I, what I've seen out there in the field is it's about latencies, it's about response time. Again, user experience, what Kristen talked about. And this is where Express Route actually comes in and fix that. Or we can enable Citrix SD VAN, which will again go in and create reliability and enable you to do, get great use experience. Then we have from the small deployment and the last deployment, you don't have point to site and small deployment. On last deployment, you have uh, um, you have side-to-side -side and express route and SD-WAN, and in multi-site, multi-subscription, you don't have the point-to-side and side-to-side. -side. So if you look at SD-WAN, what, what kind of value it brings for, for virtual apps and desktops in the cloud, it actually creates reliability uh, for, for very critical HDX experience. And they can do that both up to, to Azure and AWS and Google Cloud by putting up an SD-WAN, which you can do that now with the virtual appliance. And even co connect that down to your, your office, then you have reliability. You can also optimize uh, data traffic, so databases, file servers. You can even optimize Office 365, where Citrix have a lot of data that, which they actually showed in the, in the keynote. They even take it further, and they also do uh, for, for video on demand services and optimize that kind of traffic. And, and one of the new great things for Citrix has been working uh, close together with Microsoft is Office, uh, uh, is the Teams, um, where they do optimization for that. And then they also do uh, local rendering. So they take care of all that. I'll give you an example. So if you have SD-WAN down in your office, and SD-WAN in the, in the cloud, and you now you do a video call, uh, and the connection gets disrupted with one of the SD-WANs, then the other one takes over, and the user doesn't get disrupted. So that's why reliability is really key for this. And this is where SD VAN gives uh, value. So, you know TCP and UDP, how the differences are? This is a great example on, on a picture. Um, 
going a bit into what Citrix are working on. So what they're doing is the EDT, which is actually UDP-based. They're doing a lot of work on this, uh, where they're actually increasing the experiences. Um, but still, TCP also makes sense. And what we highly recommend, actually, if you want to learn more insights about it, our friends from, also from Netherlands, they have a session on Thursday, SIN uh, 2.15. I highly recommend they're going very in-depth in the data between TCP and UDP. So go to that session. It's really awesome what they're going to share. Another thing what we want to highlight is Citrix Cloud in the NetScale as a service don't support UDP or EDT, which is a problem. But you can fix that by bringing your own NetScaler and then you're actually enabling that and you get the EDT capability. So with Microsoft the HDX offloading um, for Teams, Citrix have created this a technical preview where you can offload traffic to the endpoint. It's a bit familiar what you know for Sky for Business optimization pack. The new, new thing about this is they now have it in, in a Teams per machines now available. And Christian, what, can, can you share a bit with me why, why this is so important? Yeah, so the, the main difference is between, let's go one back, between the per machine version and the per user version is that uh, as before this update, you install Teams in the user profile, which typically means that when you get an update for Teams on our multi-use environment, you need to update all those Teams versions on that multi-use environment. And on a Monday morning, you don't want to have that in your, yeah, in your backlog, right? Uh, so the per machine version takes it back and puts it back in the program files directory. And with that, it also updates once per machine. And you can control that by imaging, yeah, man image management, uh, just update the image and you're good to go for the uh, yeah, enterprise wing or production wing, uh, what, you, what you're using. So if you are interested in the Teams optimization pack of Citrix, there's a QR code in the, in the corner and that puts you back to, to that uh, registration uh, form, and then you get the, the bits provided by, uh, by the product manager. So let's talk about performance on-prem and in the cloud. There are some things that are like equal the same, so if you optimize on-prem and in the cloud, that's, that's the same. And that's one quote that reminds me of, of that. Uh, if, if you suck now, you will pleasantly be surprised of the lack of change when you move to the cloud. And that's basically when you lift and shift to the cloud, you take your bad performance with you to the cloud. So think about that when you move to the cloud. Optimize your uh, images, your procedure, everything uh, to, to gain and to ensure your end user experience. So why tuning tools do matter also for the cloud? Uh, we, as part of Video Like Pro, uh, did, did that survey, and we asked to the people, uh, do you currently performance tune your environment? And the majority is saying uh, that they use the VMware optimization tool or Citrix optimizer to yeah, gain and, and, and better user experience and in density performance, et cetera. Uh, and when you look at the results of that, and these are Video Like Pro measurement results, you see that you gain in like 15 or 20, uh, 10, 10, 10 users uh, when you tune it with Citrix Optimizer or the VMware Optimization Tool. So that's definitely worth it also in the cloud because when you can use more users on the machine, uh, yeah, then you can save costs as well per machine because you can yeah, fit more users on that uh, VDI. So let's talk about logon performance. Uh, also a question that we ask, What's your primary performance concern in your virtual desktop environment? So the vast majority is saying slow applications, so probably that, that resonates with you guys, probably. And the second one is, is slow logons. And slow logons is something that, that we can solve. And I will explain why or how you, uh, you can do that. So let's talk about the average logon time during several builds of, uh, of Windows 10, where you can see that the Logon duration is something like 15, 20 seconds as, as average. And along the way, updating Windows 10 from 1607 to 1809, it becomes a little bit slower, as you can see on the, the dark blue uh, metric over here. And that was the place where Windows included OneDrive in the user profile. So it installs OneDrive into the user profile at the moment the user logs on. So that's something that it solves as well by making OneDrive as well a per-machine version. So the same benefits of, of the Teams version. Um, there's a QR code as well in the, in the corner, which explains exactly what you need to do to go from the user 
to the per machine uh, version. Or you can disable and it. I know somebody does that as well. That's another way, right? You can, you can if you don't use one drive in your environment, you can remove it as well. Yes, that's true. If you use Citrix files or others, right? Um, so let's let's talk about other options that you can do to to improve your user on, user log on duration. So something that has disrupted us as well in this space uh, is the profile container technology. This is part of the FS Logic acquisition, uh, which is now part of Microsoft the Core technology. Um, when you look at the user logon process of, of a VDI or RDS environment, it's segmented in six parts. And the third part is the user profile part, where normally the user profile is loaded from the server. When you use like a roaming profile solution, your profile is very large. It takes a lot of time to, yeah, to, to load your profile from that file server to your VDI, to your, uh, to your session host. So with the profile container, you sort of stream your data in a VHD. So you don't roam the data. It's not file-based, it's block-based. And then you gain uh, in like performance uh, to from like, like 30 or 40 seconds to five seconds because it's not depending on the size of the profile anymore. It just streams the profile directly into the VHD. And that's really disruptive to, to roaming profiles right now. And another great thing what you can solve with WEM, Workspace Environment Management, is uh, putting that group policy process, that, that drive mapping attachment, after the logon duration, the initial logon screen. And then you can gain as well uh, in performance logon. Uh, and that's basically uh, this setting that you need to configure then to disable UPM and use So remove the it, right, the flag, because we have it. Yeah. So you, you, if can, you guys are awake, you would see what is enabled. We need to remove the flag to get it disabled. <laughs> yeah, but, but as default, this is already disabled. If you are a uh, UPM user, you use UPM right now, and you want to gain as well in logon duration performance, you can just disable it and use the profile container solution for that. So to give you an, yeah, like an experience expression demo, impression demo, this is a session that is configured with, um, with the profile container solution on the back. And when you click on your, on your desktop, it loads, lo loads very quickly to your, to your session. And the interesting thing about this session, as I described earlier, it includes like two ISOs on the, on the desktop and that are both five gigs. So this profile is 10 gigabytes. And when you do this with UPM, for example, you probably end up with a logon duration of like 10 seconds, a lot of coffee irritated users. Uh, and just to, uh, uh, to give you the proof, to show the user profile status of this machine. Uh, it shows like 10 gigs over here. And it's local as well, so it doesn't see that there's a uh, streaming technology in between. So that's, uh, that's something to keep an eye out for. Uh, and as well for Office 65 services, because you need to either be a Superman or use like technology like, uh, like, like, like the Avis Logix profile container. And that attaches like all the the different services of Office 65 to your desktop virtualization environment. And it is as well part of the Citrix managed desktop. So Citrix managed desktop leveraged this technology as, as profile management solution as well, uh, in conjunction probably with the WEM uh, software. And an extra bonus to that, uh, you get uh, app masking, which is an application management solution, and a Java version control solution where you can run different versions of different applications of different versions of Java on the same machine. Uh, by using app masking or Java version control. So the good thing about that uh, is that Avis Logics is for free for everyone. So that's a decision that Microsoft has been made. Even with a McDonald's Happy Meal, that's just a joke. Uh, but, but if you have like entitlement for, for these kind of licenses, uh, you get Avis Logics for free. So you can just leverage this, and yeah, without any any uh, additional uh, investment. So that's great. What I want, do want to add is, if it's logic, it's really awesome, but you also need to size your storage. You will increase your storage, right? That's so true. It's something super important to look at. And there are guidelines to optimize that. And there are a lot of blog posts out yeah, there you, as well. You need, to, you need to size based on block-based IOPS rather than on, on your throughput because it's a block-based solution. Yeah. 
And the great thing is only about 10 to 15 IOPS it creates actually. Yeah, it's, it's not much. No. Yeah. Okay, GPUs, so why do you need them? Uh, BDI, like a pro, they made also this uh, analysis, collecting all the data from customers and parts around the world. And uh, what I want to highlight is we've actually been doing this for several years, and what we see is actually increasement of GPUs being used out there in the, in the companies. What we want to highlight in the top is actually that uh, most people are adding a GPU today to get a better overall performance for their VD Windows or their VDI uh, workload. So it's not just for, you know, uh, which is the second one, which is, I think is interesting. The second one is for CAD and Photoshop and Revit. That's how we did it back in the days. That's why people adopted GPUs, only because of that. Now it's getting majorities, any kind of application. Let's see here. If the video roll, yeah. So if you've not seen this, this in video, NVIDIA they created, where you see the difference between a CPU uh, powered VDI and a GPU powered VDI. And you clearly see on, on the left, this is the CPU, you get a hit on the, on the CPU spikes. And the things are not smooth, they're not running fast. And this is actually where, where, where you're getting benefits of buying a GPU, so that the, the user can be more productive. Again, this is what David said in the keynote, it's about productivity, right? We increase productivity. This is why you pay the money for GPU. Increase productivity for the user. A lot of people talk about density and so on. Focus on productivity, how we can help the business work people faster. It's a key message that I cannot continue uh, talking about. Again, another thing is um, Excel, uh, which is shown here. Um, also, that stuff has been, been lowing faster with the GPU. Actually, this is something I've been doing. I started doing it over five years ago at a finance customer. Well, I saw a huge improvement by adding a GPU to, to typical Senate workloads so they can be more productive. And we offload the CPU, the GPU command so the, to the GPU. If you don't have a GPU, then you get hit by the CPU. And this is a problem if you don't get solved with the GPU. The same thing happens when you go to the cloud. Many people, they design stuff with CPU only. You know, so you're going from on-prem to the cloud. Remember to add a GPU instead of focusing costs. Look at increasing productivity. Microsoft is actually increasing productivity in Windows operating system. They're doing it from Windows 7 all the way up to 10, and each generation they're creating a new one, they are actually increasing uh, the API calls for both DirectX and so on, which is you know, a window sizing up and a graphical user interface, and this is where you, they are gaining and, and, and using the GPU commands for NVIDIA, why you need that GPU for it. Otherwise, they will use the CPU and you get some high spikes. This data I showed to you before is actually Lakeside that collected, but it's, it's good data. So what I recommend is where you start is actually before, you, even if you do VDI or you do Senap or multi, uh, Windows Virtual Desktop, look at the physical layer. Always look at physical machines. Go in, look at the application, what it does. How do you use GPU? Because people don't do that when they size. They even look at VDI, then they add just a GPU and, and, and put a thing up in the air, where, where is the, which direction is the air going. I always recommend going in and look at a physical le level. Why? Because you have the tool from Microsoft. They have Process Explorer. This is free. It will show you real-time data on the GPU compute and the GPU frame buffer. You can even do go down to the application and get the insights of the application. And immediately you can see, is my SAP application using GPU? Is my browser using GPU? A lot of people are looking for evidence. This one shows you the valuable data. Then the next step, when you're adding GPUs, when let's say now you design a solution in the data centers on-prem or cloud, now you want to monitor the GPU. This is so important. People forget about that. The stuff just keeps running. But we need to look at data. And on, on the right, so they can actually uh, control up, they can look uh, both on the host side, but they can also look at the VM side and the process side. So they can look at data over time, but also real time. So immediately you can go in and see on this host we had an issue, on this VM, on this process. It's really valuable what control of do here on the GPU side. Another one I want to highlight, so UberAgent is a tool, it's a super fantastic tool that can go in and look at data over time. And again, when was you impacted? Which application used a GPU? What they do a bit different here is 
he can go in and look at the, uh, the GPU from both AMD, NVIDIA, and Intel. All right? It's actually super valuable. He just released a new uh, release where he can even see the stuff you actually get from Windows 10 uh, Task Manager. So he looks at video processing, decoding, encoding, and 3D. Very, very, very valuable. And again, it gives you insights on how you're using GPU over time. Do I need more GPUs? The data is the stuff that will help you uh, convince your uh, management. So NVIDIA, they, they released a new T4, which is the new universal GPU. The interesting thing about this GPU is its low form factor GPU. And uh, by adding two of these, it's single slot. So typically, if people, they do M10. This one, you can do two T4s. So uh, from a density point of view, you get the same, but you get much, much higher GPU compute. And also, you get stuff like real-time ray tracing, et cetera. And you can even use it for, for AI if you switch it at nighttime. The great thing is Google is actually one of the, the first cloud adopters where now you can actually provision with MCS, Citrix, and then use the T4 GPUs for that, and you get that awesome experience. So let's share our personal top five tools and performance best practices that we use on, on cloud workloads and on-premises workloads as well. So Tom has already shared like two tools. Uh, one best practice that you need to keep in mind when you leverage cloud services, uh, keep in mind that you can save a lot of money when you go for reserve instances, which typically means is when you uh, yeah, use like VMs in Azure or any other clouds, um, that you pay already upfront for your resource for one year, three years. So it doesn't matter if you put your image on, on, on on, like sh shut them down or put them on hold or anything like that. You just reserve that instance for you, and that can you know, like, like save you a lot of money, like 50% or something. Another great thing is to use uh, power management tools. And keep in mind that the breaking point between going for reserve instances or using power management tools is like 70% of uptime during the, the week. So if you have more than 70 percent of the week your, your machine is running, then reserve instances is cheaper for you than using power man management tools like Citrix Autoskill. Citrix Autoskill is a solution uh, that is uh, available on Citrix Cloud where you can like, uh, spin up machines based on your resources that you need as well after business hours or during business hours, shut them down and then save costs during, uh, during the day on, on your resources in the cloud. So that's, that's available. And um, yeah, that's, that's part of the Citrix Cloud uh, services. And with that, you can also see what you save and cost based on your cloud that you're using. So you can see the money that you save during the day or the week uh, to, uh, yeah, while you're leveraging out of skill, for example. Yeah, and the RD Analyzer. So when you give uh, the Dutch guy some can of milk and some, uh, some strofwafels, then magic comes out of it. Actually, so RD Analyzer is a community tool, <laughs> and it's super awesome. It is, if you never tried this tool, I highly recommend it. Again, this gives you insights of the HTX protocol and gives you insights on bandwidth, frames, quality, and even data over time. The cool thing about this tool is if you pay a few uh, dollars for it, you actually open up the tool, and then you can change the policies. So you don't have to create policies, log in, log out. They do it real time, so then you can see a, a, a change in visual quality of frames, uh, switching from uh, TCP to UDP, and et cetera. Actually, the UDP, that is a feature that's getting worked on, so I shouldn't say that, uh, but it's getting there. That is a super awesome tool. They also do insights about uh, NVIDIA, so you can actually see how the GPU is getting, uh, getting used, uh, both with encode and decode. Another tool that I highly recommend is a tool uh, from uh, NVIDIA, it's a com community tool actually he created called GPU Profiler, uh, which you can use on your, your NVIDIA infrastructure. Here you see stuff like CPU, GPU, encode, decode, and the protocol, and frame buffers, and network. You, he looks not just Windows, but also Linux, and it's a super great tool. If you have not used it, again, it's free to download, free to use. The last one I want to highlight is the future. So Benetrit is uh, creating this uh, super amazing tool. You've probably seen it, uh, his sessions. They are super awesome. Because he, he's showing visually what is happening between the protocols. 
and when you do a change and the analytics behind the stuff, right? Which is the difficult part. Because when you look at user experience, it's the eyes looking at where the user is, and we sit down, right? The only thing to, to measure that is having a side-by-side -side comparison. And this is where the Rex Analytics is a, a super, super valuable tool. So I'm, I'm very excited when, when the tool gets uh, shipped out there so we can get it on. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's fantastic work Benny has done. So this is the time where we are going to raffle the prizes away. So I hope you uh, pay attention to answer those questions. I would say just raise your hand when you know your answer and shout it out loud, and then you win one of those prizes. So the first question, number one. Small drum roll. And this is the prize for so uh, this word, one here. So what <laughs> word is the same in Danish and Dutch? Huh? Yeah, that guy. What? He won. He, he, he knew it as fast. Give an applause. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's good, you're, you're awake. So he's Dutch, so that's great. <laughs> so question number two. <laughs> so what product can help you to speed up your logon duration? Epistolics. Yeah, but for you, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <Epistolics>. Yeah. <laughs> that, that guy over there. Yeah. Give him a pause. Welcome. There you go. So, one more thing before we wrap up this session. Keep in mind that because of cloud services, it's our job to decircify shitty end user experience because, because that becomes way and way more important these days because we go to desktop as a service solutions, etc. So, that's the thing that stays the most important for your end users. So with that, I would like to say, if you have any questions, just go to the microphone or go, come yeah, to us. So we have, we have two microphones in the middle. If you guys want to challenge us, I have any questions. <laughs> it's not a challenge, but um, the FS Logics uh, VHD or profile container, do you have to use FS Logics, or is there something in pro a newer profile management that, that you use containers as well? Um, the, the expectations are that uh, the profile container will be uh, like integrated as well in WM, but that's still something that maybe will happen. Uh, but regarding right now, it's just a separate profile product, so you can use it in conjunction uh, without any consoles or management tools next to it. In what product are you talking about? FS the profile Logics. container for Avis Logics. Okay, thanks. Yes. Okay, thank you. Some more questions? And actually, so the license, it's a small teaser, right? So there's, when you download FS Logics today, you get a trial. So Microsoft is working on getting that. Yeah, there, Can you there, share a bit what you guys there, are doing? There will be a new client available for FS Logics in the next month or two, uh, which takes away the need to enter in a license key. So you're good to go, and you can just upgrade your, if you have a current setup, you can upgrade it. But if you're a new customer or you want to try it, you can just use the bits from microsoft.com slash download, and you're good to go. Okay, great. One more. Would that uh, FS Logics container um, complement user layering and app layering, or would it replace it? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think that app layering will still be there, uh, and it's just another solution that you can leverage. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's probably the best answer that I can give right now. Okay, I was specifically meaning the user layering. It, yeah, so it, it's sort of like similar in terms of technology. So it's also using a VHD. Uh, but to use the user layer, you need to have like the complete app layering suite. So you need to upgrade or okay. change your image management. And this is just a separate thing for your user profile. So you can use it in conjunction as well with app layering and just don't use the user layer, for example. Yeah. Okay. That's you, can, possible. you can also use Eventsy. Uh, yeah, you, you can workspace or what? That's you, possible. The, as well. the old absence, right? That yeah. works, and actually even rest. Exactly. If you have another UEM solution yeah. and you want to leverage the same benefits, then you can use it as well in conjunction. I really highly recommend you. If you don't, if you're not tried FS Logics today, use WEM, roaming, 
absence or you know any of the other ones yeah. add it in and then see how incredible it makes your life you a get. lot easier so. exactly it's, you, you gain a huge win but then like, the downside is your storage gets you know oh, you need hungry. to you need to size your storage environment proactively that's that's right. as always the thing so that's that's the only thing to keep in mind but but that's not a problem that's just something you need to keep in mind in your designing phase okay. another question yeah so you mentioned uh you, you talked about FS Logics containers, and then you mentioned, I think, Avanti Environment Manager, right? Yeah. Has the VHD uh, for your for, for Office 365, yeah. right? So with FS Logic, it still stores the VHD on a storage device somewhere on your network, correct? In SMB Share, and Invest Share, yeah, or okay. Azure is possible as well. Yeah, and so the at that time it mounts the VHD. But the yep. VHD still resides on the storage. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So if so you so if you're having storage issues, you could see some performance issues. Um, yes and no. There's another solution which is cloud cache, and that takes away um, like that that like whisk, and that's something you can use as like alternative for that. Uh, but like if you have a storage environment and you have like two nodes and a cluster environment, you you yeah you take care of that redundancy uh, on that side. So. Yeah, and if you want some insights, again, FS Logic is actually Uber agent. <laughs> Just, they are doing actually some really good uh, data because he gets SMB data. Yeah. So he can get the data over time, how you get impacted. They have metrics with Splunk, and they can yeah, go very You can download a trial and try it out and see how good it is. It's actually, for a proof of concept, it's really, really valuable yes. doing like that. So another question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, people asking about how about management of an FS Logics profile, because everything is uh, stuffed in a VHD. Yeah. Uh, does a uh, previous version, is that supported with uh, the profile? Cur or? Currently that's not supported, it's not in the product, uh, but we think that partners will leverage that solution based on top of the native profile container solution, as of today. But maybe in the future that will change, and then you will have like versioning in your profile. Yeah, but but awesome. based on that streaming technology, like pro profile corruption and, and everything around that, that is not like an issue anymore. But in terms of going back to a previous state of an application, no, that's not possible right now. No, maybe in the future, but not right now. But maybe it's it is possible with Windows previous versions because the, that makes a snapshot every so hours. You said yeah. it. Yeah, you but can, that isn't supported also, or you can use that, but that's just another solution to to do the same that you do in a previous other solution or other use case. But you can use like like uh, volume shadow copies and etc. That's possible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Yeah. Hey, a lot of your a lot of your tools were around performance based, yeah, measuring performance. Um, is there anything that you recommend about that user experience over a trended? Um, you know, trending on user experience, similar to like a user experience score. You got any tools that you'd recommend you for that? So there, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, Login VSI is one where you can do, you know, performance and tests, right? Uh, but that's different if you want to do for existing data workloads you have, right? So yeah. Uber Agent is actually one of them where you go in and then see, uh, you know, productivity and so on. And that will give you, you a user experience score type of thing, will it? You want to score? Or well, yeah, effectively. Some, sometimes with our customers, we you, may, you, they may say, let's see whether there's yeah, a drop yeah. in user Makes sense. User so that's more so Liquidware I have that and Lakeside. Okay. They, they, they are probably the, the, the best to, tools out there. And to elaborate on that, Login PI is another solution as well, and that focuses exactly on that thing that you are mentioning, like the user, the user session and gives a score as well. So that's maybe something to watch out for as well. Yeah, okay. but, but because Citrix is going there right now with that uh, the analytics. Yeah, with the analytics stuff yeah. exactly. that's coming. Yeah. So we need to wait how far that goes in your question, your use case, but maybe that's something as well to keep an eye on. Yeah, but you, yeah. I would say Lakeside, I, that is a great tool because where you can get it. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. okay, thanks. So any more questions? No. Okay, great. So I would like to thank you for being here and have a great conference. Yeah, thanks, guys.